Welcome to Newnham House. Right now, you're looking at what we call the presentation room, one of the two main meeting rooms used by the Brahma Kumaris today in the operation of this, the Global Retreat Center. But things weren't always this way. The original Newnham House was recorded in the Doomsday Book of 1086, and it would have looked something like this. It was positioned a little way from where we are now, near the site of where the chapel is. However, it wasn't until 1710 when this gentleman, Viscount Simon Harcourt, who had had an illustrious career as Lord Chancellor and Ambassador to Paris and Viceroy of Ireland for Queen Anne, bought 8,000 acres of land here for the princely sum of £17,000, which is the equivalent of about £2 million today. Viscount Harcourt's grandson, another Simon, the first Earl Harcourt, inherited the 8,000 acres in 1727, at the young age of only 13. But it wasn't until a bit older, in his mid-40s, having gained a love for architecture on account of his travels through Europe, that he returned in 1756 to supervise the construction of the new Newnham House, which was finished four years later in 1760. Now, although the first Earl was an important fellow, finding stone for his new house wasn't so easy, due in large part to the fact that the Duke of Marlborough was building Blenheim Palace at exactly the same time. But nevertheless, with the help of his architect, a chap called Stiff Ledbetter, who by the way was the principal carpenter at Eton College, a compact Palladian villa was erected. This original square postage stamp building that you'll be touring today was only suitable for an occasional retreat and not as a full-time residence. But isn't it nice to know that the original idea of the house being used as a retreat place is once again functioning for the same purpose? The site for the house comes with a story which speaks to the enormous power held by the aristocracy in those days. For as it happened, the first Earl particularly liked the view of the river you can see from the house today. His problem was that the original village was situated right in his line of sight. Solution? Move the village! And that's why you see today a rather fine example of 18th century brick houses all along the A4074 just before you come down our driveway. In 1777, the second Earl, George Simon Harcourt, inherited. This Earl was quite different from his father. Where the first Earl was all propriety and pomposity, the second Earl was quite the opposite. A Republican at heart, he was an artist and idealist who had no brief for grandeur or hypocrisy. In his youth, he was greatly influenced by what he called his divine philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. But middle age, his friend's amusement, and his wife's hankering after court, finally cured him of his Republican leanings. Nevertheless, he did retain his Rousseauian love of nature, of which you can still see much evidence in the gardens and buildings on the property today. When the Earl died, the Times paid a glowing tribute to him as the patron of struggling artists, a champion of human rights, and a public benefactor. Over the years, the villa gradually got extended to meet the requirements of Lady Harcourt and the family. The North Wing provided offices and the South Wing further family accommodation. Rooms were also built over the link corridors. In 1779, Lancelot Capability Brown arrived on the scene to work on the interior and to landscape the northwest aspect of the grounds. The Harcourts made improvements in the 1770s. The interior was remodeled. The original external double staircase where visitors entered the house at the first floor level was removed. And an entrance was made on the ground floor through the former kitchens, which were converted into the reception hall you saw when you came in today. Curved corridors were added, linking the wings of the house to the main block and also wide balconies were built at first floor level in order to enjoy the new landscape. In 1832, 
the Harcourts employed Robert Smirk to further enlarge the house. The south wing was extended significantly in a style in keeping with the original work. This was the last major extension to the house, bringing the size to 104 rooms in total, including 65 bedrooms. The house had many important visitors over the years. King George III, known as Mad King George, had been tutored by the second Earl Harcourt and the families were friends. King George and Queen Charlotte were visitors to the house in 1786. During the visit, the king disappeared. He was eventually found in the servants' parlour, drinking cups of tea and chasing the housemaids in a game of tag. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert stayed in 1841, soon after their wedding. Prince Albert was collecting an honorary degree from the university and the Queen wrote, This is a most lovely place. Pleasure grounds in the style of Claremont, only much larger, and with the Thames winding along beneath them, and Oxford in the distance, a beautiful flower garden and kitchen garden, and all kept in perfect order. Charles Dodgson, better known as Lewis Carroll, was a frequent visitor to the house in the 1860s. With Alice Little and her family, Dodgson would come on picnics, they would row down the river to Newnham House and have lunch at the Harcourt's boathouse. The stories he would tell were included in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. Alice's memoirs noted, most of Mr. Dodgson's stories were told us on river expeditions to Newnham and to Godstow. In 1904, work was done to the gallery at the front, changing the appearance of the facade. The original stone was not available, and so they had to go to another quarry. The stone, however, although it looked the same when it was built, has weathered differently, and this is what accounts for the two-tone appearance that you see today. Up until the Second World War, the house maintained its original grandeur. Here, for instance, is a picture of the front lawn bearing the Harcourt coat of arms made out of box hedging. During the Second World War, the Royal Air Force requisitioned the house as its central interpretation unit for wartime reconnaissance, where they analysed aerial surveillance photographs for the war effort. The decorative elements of the original house were boarded up to protect them, however after the war, the house did fall into a degree of disrepair and was finally abandoned in 1947. The Harcourt family went to live in their ancestral home at Stanton Harcourt and Oxford University bought the estate as an investment in 1948 and it still owns it today. In 1959, part of the house was going to be converted into flats. The scheme fell through though and the building was then going to be knocked down but was considered to be architecturally unique because of the influence of the Greek, French and Roman styles and the involvement of Capability Brown in designing the interiors and the grounds. As a result, the house was Grade II listed and so protected from demolition. In 1966, the university began an extensive refurbishment project as part of an agreement with Cullum Teacher Training College. The college would lease the house as a dormitory for trainee teachers. In the late 1970s, the house was leased by Rothmans, the international tobacco company. Rothmans refreshed and refurbished the house and gardens and used it as a conference center for about 10 years. Following an unsuccessful attempt in 1989 by an international hotel group to make it into a five-star hotel, it was left empty for more than four years. And so, in 1993, the Brahmacal Murrays was incredibly lucky to be able to take over the lease from the receivers for a fraction of its real worth. After six months of intensive refurbishment, we opened the Global Retreat Center, and since then, it's welcomed nearly 200,000 people from across the world. The Retreat Center offers the perfect place for people to step away from the frantic pace of modern living and to restore balance and focus to their lives through guided programs of solitude, silence, and the study of spiritual values. We offer residential and one-day retreats, lectures, seminars, and courses on meditation, personal growth, and spiritual development. 
These offer the chance to explore the deepest insights into our true nature, to review the purpose of life, and to learn practical methods to sustain calm and clarity in everyday living. As a service to the community, there are no charges or fees for any of our activities. The Centre is funded by voluntary contributions and is run by volunteers. You're about to leave this room now, but before you go, just take a closer look and imagine what it must have been like during the heydays of the 18th and 19th centuries. Originally, this was the dining room. The features to note in this room are the fireplace, the pillars and the windows with views to the chapel and the River Thames. The Earl was enthusiastic about three styles of architecture and asked Ledbetter to incorporate French, Greek and Roman features into the design. For example, the fireplace has Greek motifs. It's the only original fireplace remaining in the house and is on the National Heritage List for England. The columns are a type of imitation marble that was fashionable at that time. It's a painting technique known as scagliola. The room has further Venetian windows and a dining balcony facing lawns and shrubberies. It would have been from this balcony that you could have seen the original village of Newnham Courtney before it was removed. If you look out of the window across the balcony, you'll see the family chapel which is just visible at the top of the slope. It was built in 1764, after the village was relocated. By 1800, the grounds had matured and various artists arrived to paint the results. Some designs depicting the house and gardens were used on Staffordshire pottery and became some of the most popular patterns ever. It was known as Wild Rose Newnham Courtney. We mentioned earlier the Harcourt's association with royalty. Queen Victoria's son, Bertie, who became Edward VII, continued the friendship of the monarchy and the Harcourts. Edward was a frequent visitor to the house in the late 1800s and stayed in a special king's bedroom, which had been designed by Capability Brown for the visit, originally, of George III in 1784. Edward gifted his coronation carpet to the Harcourts, which they placed in the nave of the family chapel, where you can see it today. And now, before you move into the next rooms, here's a glimpse of what they were like in days gone by. This is the drawing room, a very ornate but comfortable room where the family would withdraw to relax, especially during the times when there were no guests in the house. And this is the ballroom, now the main conference room, the grandest room in the house, where the Earl and his wife held parties and entertained important guests. Finally, this is now called the anteroom, which was originally the grand hallway of the house, used when the original entrance was here on the first floor. So thank you for taking the time to take this virtual tour. We hope to see you in real life sometime soon.